I hope the sound and the connection is still working okay. I'm getting a lot of oh no's. Okay. Well, we're all in, yep, we're getting yeps. So my accidental restart actually was a good thing. Let's go with that. Great. It's good. It's all better. It's back. Fabulous. <laughs> Julian okay. is wearing his bonnet right now. Julian, you're wearing your bonnet. No, I'm just, beautiful. Please <laughs> send us a picture on Twitter. Okay. He has. It's, it's 7.31, so I'm going to start the broadcast proper welcome. Hello and welcome to week two of live chat for the Survive Your PhD MOOC. Wow. What an amazing week. 11,500 people now in the course, which is just incredible. Um, and I hope those new people who've joined us have had time to catch up. Hopefully their workload wasn't too massive. And of course, the discussion boards have exploded with activity. It's crazy in there. We've been doing our best to keep up and uh, we just encourage you to participate as you like. All that we ask is either post a response or post a new thread. Um, there is no word count. You can be as active or as inactive as you like and just participate in what interests you and there's plenty of there um, to discuss. Now, don't forget you can vote up post and Katie tweeted a link earlier today that showed you how to vote up a post and we'll put it also in our um, live chat wrap up. Um, so just remember too if you see someone who's upset and needs attention you think from the moderators you can report it this does not mean you've reported them as in stop it's the police you've been reported it just means that we can see if someone's in trouble upset hurting and we can we can pay attention. Um, so last week Katie storified the Twitter chat and I've said in my notes here that I sent you Katie that you're going to tweet it right now yep. and she's going to tweet the link to her storify and I hope Katie also saw in the notes that I've left for her the link to my storify as well. So those of you who are not really into go following us on Twitter and that's totally fine can see uh, some of the top things that have been going on and it's been great. Uh, there's been also some really great links th sent through uh, about medieval traditions that are still alive in our university and uh, Katie's going to send a link out on Twitter now to just about uh, the best one that we received online so thank you for that and thank you for all the images. Special social media contributor badges this week um, are going to five people who we thought were doing really great work there so that's at Wide White Stage who I believe I met in Tasmania hello and also hello to my nephew Ollie who watches in Tasmania hello Ollie Good to see you. Um, at Marina Loves Chem, at Rosie Chang, at Maria Hugland, and at Cassandra Steer also. So we'll be sending you uh, special social media contributor badges. Thanks, guys. Um, in the discussion forums, we were so impressed with the level of erudite and polite and respectful conversation and really interesting topics being brought up. So we'd like to give two badges out for our special forum. I mean, we could have given thousands. But we'll give them to Simon James B, who started what we thought was a really respectful and thoughtful discussion on gender and coming from a white guy who was really scared to raise the issues. Good on you. Um, that went really well. Uh, we'd also like to thank Gabrielle P. McPhee for some thoughtful commentary and we've noticed that she was doing a lot of commenting on other people's posts as well. So thank you for that. We'll be sending you badges. Okay, um, many of us, of course, reading some of the course material, we're very jealous that in Europe that some people get top hats and swords when they graduate. Um, there were some good pictures of that posted on the forum. Um, and please, someone invite me to one of those ceremonies. I'd love to come and uh, pretend to wear a top hat. I totally want a sword. Yes, rock, paper, knit. I would like a sword. Okay, um, now a discussion in our, in our forums provoked lots of discussions about how we do and we don't conform to some of these historical norms and values that have been set up in the material. Um, and in response to a really interesting post by Simon James B, as we mentioned before, we had a whole discussion about the value system we've inherited from academia. Um, Simon was interested in whether the, what he saw as the, the fe female fe oh, feminist bent, and I do identify as a feminist bent, in the material, um, and the gender issues that were raised more generally there suggested that more women than men would be attracted to doing this MOOC. And one of our moderators, Anna, actually went and dug into the interesting stats that we have available to us about the number of people doing the MOOC. And she found that 156 countries are represented and females do in fact make up more than half the total, but only 55%, so only just over half. Now 43% males and about 2% identified as other. Okay, so it's showing that I think the course has broad appeal across both genders and I think that sort of speaks to the way that 
um, the, the systems that are set up, they also um, both privilege and disadvantage men and women. It's not that for some reason women are still much more disadvantaged those from the system, although they still they might be in some cases. And um, this promoted a really lively discussion about scholarship practices. And of course, I had to throw my, as we say in Australia, my two cents worth, which is just saying I'm throwing in my opinion for what it's worth. And observed that uh, men and women experienced very, very similar issues in my experience with PhD study um, and pro similar problems. And um, I raised the notion, the figure of the expert, so this idea of expertise. And I noted that scholars from the 18th and 19th century are extraordinarily well read. When you read uh, their, you know, see how many books they wrote, uh, see the level of thinking that was there, it's really quite amazing. They could speak multiple ancient languages and their breadth and depth of scholars, scholars was unparalleled. I don't think many of us today match that kind of expertise. Um, but if you think about it, it was much easier to achieve this ideal back in those times because all their meals were cooked for them. Uh, they uh, never had to read a bus timetable. Uh, they never had to pick the kids up from school. I don't think they even did their own washing. Uh, someone cleaned their rooms. In a way, you can actually think about these scholars in the 18th and 19th centuries being infantilised. Um, they're not actually independent uh, members of society like we are today. Um, and But this sort of... Their, their ideal that they set up, this notion of the scholar that's so steeped in expertise, is a value that still hangs around and still haunts us. And students often tell me, for example, that, um, that they feel like they haven't read enough, that they haven't done enough, that they haven't made enough to really make a PhD. And they're responding to that value set, that really, really high standard that was set, I think, back in those days. And um, those values were really built for a different kind of person. They were built for celibate men who lived essentially in a monastery. And we can never actually achieve that today. Even if you're younger and you don't have as many family, uh, family responsibilities, I think you still usually have to catch the bus sometimes. You usually have to do your own dishes. And so many of us just don't have the kind of time that it takes to develop that expertise. And that's why I think it's really important to tackle this history. This isn't a feminist diatribe by any means. This is just a recognition that, that this history created amazing things, created the university for us, but it also left us with this legacy and that maybe we shouldn't always measure ourselves against those unrealistic standards. Anyway, that's a thought that you can just take on um, on your own and I see that Minimum Chips is talking there on Periscope about the disproportionate amount of home duties that some women take on and I think that's certainly true. Some men take on disproportionate amount of home duties as well. Um, and I'm a single parent at the moment because Mr Thesis Whisperer is in Europe. Hello Mr Thesis Whisperer. And so I know what that's like when you're just taking sole responsibility. So some of us have way more on our shoulders than others. Many people jumped on this thread and I thought they shared some really interesting insights and Katie and Steph are going to tweet these for you now. So Gatorin posted a link to an exhibition about women in education, which is really interesting. Kelly in Oklahoma showed us about the first woman to graduate from New Zealand. Um, Nellie BDS discussed how difficult it was to balance family life with being a professor in Belgium, which we thought was very interesting because Belgium and Sweden and Scandinavian countries generally are well known for having public policies that support gender equity. So if it's even happening there, that's slightly depressing. Um, Andrea Kulken, I hope I got that right, contributed a link to a blog post in Swedish about gender inequality there. Um, and we're going to post the link in Swedish and we're not going to be um, English um, hegemony here. Um, those of you who can read Swedish will get to read something that we can't read, but I'm assuming. Um, it says something about the statistics of, of the professorship in Belgium, and apparently only 22% of professors are female there, despite all the good government policies. And Elizabeth Tetzelius, I hope I got that right too, sent in a rather sobering uh, link about gender bias in peer review, which is really worth reading. So these issues are really still with us. And Julian Canty, who's also been very active on Twitter, thank you, Julian, um, says, and summed it up nicely, I think, I think there's plenty of evidence that women continue to be disadvantaged in academia in a lot of ways, including degree of respect accorded to their work, formal and informal mentorship, as well as structural problems like promotions and such. And Justin then sent us through a link to the LSE Impact blog, which the moderators will tweet, about this. And he says, the pernicious effect of normal academic career neatly draws together a few interesting threads on the persistence of sexism in the university 
particularly here talking about career progression, research metrics, and assumptions about support systems surrounding the normal academic, which he says are soaked in sexist and heteronormative assumptions. And those men of you uh, I know who want to take active part in raising children will also be experiencing some of these sort of structural inequities. So it's not because you're a woman or a man, it's because of some of the structures and the values in the system. And an anonymous and very touching post from a South American um, reader put a human face on these dilemmas um, when he or she said, before, and I'm, it's a she, so before joining a PhD, I had to decide between getting married and start a PhD. My ex didn't want me to continue studying because a PhD is a long journey and does not give any money. Because he expected to have a big family and my fertile age is about to finish, I was really happy about getting married, but I also felt the curiosity of the PhD. Many things happened, and at the end of the story, I applied for the PhD. I still have to deal with a lot of critics about it. There is always someone from the family reminding you that your cousin got married last week, your best friend is pregnant, blah, 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 is engaged. I do not regret being a PhD student, but sometimes I just feel lonely and I look outside the window of the lab when I'm doing a DNA extraction. I actually got tears in my eyes when I read that because I thought these, there's a real human cost to some of these structural um, systems. And I think being knowledgeable about it, critically aware of it, really helps us talk back to it in interesting ways. Um, Joanna, Johanna BD wrote, and just um, getting on to some of the other issues that were raised in the forums, I was interested to read that humanities PhD students tend to work alone with guidance and their supervisor on their writing from time to time. This has been my experience to date, but I wondered why is there a less collaborative approach to PhD research in the humanities compared to those in science? And many people replied very well to this thread, I thought. Uh, Lara Sanderson pointed out that funding has a lot to do with it. So scientists, they need to share equipment, they need to share lab spaces just to get research done. And Rachie Mace pointed out that humanities students don't need this kind of equipment and they don't have usually those kind of lab spaces where they can easily mingle, get to know people and share ideas. And this, this can be a problem that can sort of contribute to PhD student isolation. Although some people noted that there tends to be little clusters of humanities students in the basement of many university libraries. I spent three weeks in a basement at Melbourne Uni. I got to know the people in the basement and they were pretty awesome. So big shout out to, to my basement friends at Melbourne Uni. I made two really great friends in the basement. So even humanities scholars can um, make those links if we're put in the same space. Kim Goodwin asked, why don't uni Australian universities, and this is um, particularly for those of us down under, include a viva or public defence of the PhD? I sometimes feel we're miss missing out on a valuable milestone of completion. And similarly, um, ER, ETR 710 remarked, do you think the PhD process we go through now is better than when it originated? I feel like the academic disputation process that was talked about in the module is almost a better display of knowledge than producing an extensive written document. If you can argue your point under pressure, I think you know your stuff pretty well. And that is really pretty true. And many of us in the Australian sector agree with you, Kim. Um, now, the reason we don't have vivas is Australia is very lightly populated for its size. And originally, there just weren't enough local scholars to provide the kind of audience for Aviva um, that, um, that would be make it actually valid. You know, they wouldn't have the expertise or the skills. So we developed a big alternative blind peer review model. But of course, technology has moved on a long way since then. Here I am talking to you over Periscope. Why can't we have Aviva by Periscope and Twitter chat? That would be awesome. Um, except for when Periscope, you know, kind of goes in and out like this. But anyway, technology's moved on. New Zealand does Vivas for all their students and has for some time. So it's quite actively under debate here in Australia. In Australia, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's taken up in more places. Some places have it. Uh, I think it's more a matter of inertia than anything else that it hasn't happened everywhere. It just takes a long time to get the policies and processes in order. Um, moving on, Prohith 1988 asked, don't you love these usernames? I just love it. Um, which is the best PhD model? In other words, which model of the PhD program really makes a difference in candidature? Apprenticeship or independent? And in a similar vein, Audrey said, any supervisor that leaves you on your own is doing you a favour, right? Otherwise, how else can you become an autonomous independent researcher? Now, there were some really good um, responses from people on the MOOC for, to this theme. Um, Pika Zelonoznik, Zel sorry, I, I tried, um, <laughs> pointed out that we could think about supervision 
as existing on a continuum from very structured to very independent. I like this idea and it's certainly one we're going to explore in much greater de detail in our module on confusion. Marina, Marina Chandow made the same point. A teacher knows the right answer, she says. A supervisor does not. If they did, there'd be no point in us doing the research. So when I ask my supervisor, I'm not asking for an answer or a quick way out of my problem. I'm asking for feedback from a peer, which is a really interesting point of view. Um, and Satellite 007, great username. Um, letting students try first and not giving feedback is totally different, they argue. Similarly, becoming independent researchers is different from leaving students without any feedback and support. So clearly, opinions vary. And it's a lively debate again. And part of the reason that we structured the MOOC in the way we did was not to sort of put one forward, one totalizing point of view about these things, but to open it up. Because hopefully a lot of you will end up being supervisors yourselves. You'll look back on this MOOC and then think about all these different options and these different thoughts and how you can calibrate yourself within this as a practice. Those of you who are already supervising will get to think about how do you supervise? Where do you fit on this continuum? Why are you doing it that way? Is it the way, best way to be doing things? Are there other ways? Um, and I think we can all agree though, um, leaving students hanging with, our, with very little or no feedback is not really desirable. It's a very delicate line to walk indeed. In fact, supervision is incredibly difficult to do well. Uh, moving on, Matt Lebeck, Lebecken, I tried, sorry, um, asked about dealing with isolation. But we're actually going to be picking this up on the module on loneliness in great detail, so I won't cover it here. Um, D Rose H64 made the point, while one model might be an unrealistic goal, given the differing universities around the world, there must be some common factors that can be drawn together as guidelines and or training modules for both research student and for supervisors. These guidelines modules could be then adapted and modified to suit the diverse academic personalities and relationships that evolve and will continue to evolve. Now, we'll really be looking at this in great detail in the module on confusion, but there are a couple of books that address these issues. I mean, there's been quite a live um, debate and trade in supervision and supervision practices in books and guidelines for a while. So I've got a couple of my favourites, which um, Katie and Steph are going to tweet out now. And I'll recommend these to anyone who's interested in reading. Um, sorry about the connection. Doing my best. Um, reading about the good soup. Reading about um, the issue in a book. So, Gina Whiskers, the Good Supervisor, is a great place to start. Um, if you're in Australia, or even if you're not, you can pick up Supervising Doctors Down Under, um, which is not just about Australian supervision. is actually really useful. And I think one of my favourites out of that, and one that I've used a lot in our module on confusion, is a book by Anne Lee called Successful Research Supervising Advising Students, which is probably a very dull title for quite an interesting book. Um, an anonymous poster asked, does your university have orientation or workshops for supervisors and PhD students to attend? Events that allow villages or network support systems to grow. Perhaps to clarify the role or expectations of supervisors. And this is a very interesting question because it foreshadows very nicely the final assignment. We'll be asking you in the final assignment to design such solutions and um, uh, issues for your local universities. Um, so we won't give you much more detail now. We'll give you more when the assignment is launched. You'll have a lot of freedom in how you go about that. Um, but in the meantime, you might want to have a look at what's already happening inside your university if that's where you're located. Um, and see where the gaps and opportunities might be, because maybe you'll be able to use what you design at the end of this MOOC, actually really make it happen, which would be awesome. Um, Eternal Vigilance, love the username, um, asked, I hinted traditions for weddings, stating something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, and I asked, what should and shouldn't be changed in contemporary PhD and academic practices? Uh, well, what should be changed? I don't know, I'll leave it to you. I think you've got much more ideas than me. Um, and uh, I'd love to see people more add more thoughts to this thread, uh, which we can summarise at a later date. Another uh, anonymous poster asked, what happens if two supervisors contradict each other regularly? Which one has the most power? The more senior of the one working more closely with the student, who should the student listen to? It is left up to the student to try and comprehend which way forward as the supervisors don't communicate with each other. And we had some really good responses to this question, but I've written also a longer, much longer post about this called Mum and Dad are Fighting, What Should I Do? And Katie's going to, link, um, to send the link now um, to that blog post. 
Um, but I did compare um, arguing supervisors to arguing parents and talked about what happens in a divorce. What do you do? Whose side do you take? Um, and I tried to give you some, some straightforward advice. So if anyone's actually experiencing that problem at the moment, that's probably a good post to read. Another anonymous student asks, how does the inherited model of master apprentice align with the contemporary expectations of mentorship during a research degree? And Skipper Girl had a really good response when she said, this is a question I've often pondered. I feel that an apprenticeship closely matches my ideal of the postgraduate researcher experience. However, what seems to be missing in some cases, e.g. the classic humanities PhD described in the course readings, is the element of working alongside more skilled colleagues, opportunities to watch them work, assisting with the structured, menial, low risk work, and gradually taking on more complex responsibilities. I can't help feeling that there is little opportunity to work alongside a master, a journeyman, then the notion of apprenticeship is a fallacy. A mentor may have a broader advisory role. For some students and modes of PhD, this might be sufficient, but I would not term it an apprenticeship. And thank you, Kat, for that really insightful uh, take and comment. I think we're, when we talk about mentoring, we're also not pointing out the contribution that students can make and think Kat um, made, that, made that observation that students can also help submit um, to change supervisor thinking as well. So the mentorship sort of goes two ways. It's a really interesting area. Two last questions um, from the live chat feed um, discussion forum. Robin Oberg asks, why the pressure to finish on time these days? And yeah, there is a lot of pressure. I know there's a lot of pressure in the UK system and there's pressure in the Australian system. In Australia, at least, it's mostly driven by our policy settings, which I will not bore you with today, this evening. If you want more detail on this, just refer it to my, the post written by my good friend, Dr. Hare, Mary Helen Ward. Um, and the moderators will tweet the link out now, but the post is called Money Makes the World Go Around. I think there's similar pressures in universities in other countries. And finally, Rebecca01 uh, takes us out to the big meta level when she asks, what's the point of a research degree? Good question. Certainly there's some difference in opinion on this. Is it to further knowledge, enhance the university's reputation, create independent thinkers, increase IP that can strengthen the nation's economy, make getting a job easier? I don't know, um, Rebecca O'Wan, I don't know where to start. It's a really great question. It's one, of course, that's under active debate like many others. I like to think of it in two ways. One, that we're producing really highly trained researchers and considering that 60% of our PhD students go outside the university in Australia, I think this helps our workforces play, stay current and deal with complexity and change. And I think number two is that the thesis itself is a really valuable document. Uh, no longer is it this thing that only three people read. Most of them exist in online repositories and can be downloaded thousands of times. So don't let anyone give you that old old horse nut that, you know, there's no point in writing it. No one's going to read it. They do read it. It's a very current and live document and will circulate long after you are gone. And that is all I have on my notes, which were very extensive this week. Um, but I will stick around for some questions and eat some chocolate. So do we have any questions from the Twitter feed or anything emerging, Katie? Um, chocolate. Lots of people were really into the mom and dad are fighting. Oh, the mom and dad are <laughs> fighting first, yeah. <laughs> yep, and there was also uh, um, a lot of interest in um, people started sharing stories right away of how their partners supported them through their thesis. Oh. Um, a lot of people sharing things like, my partner's cooking dinner for me right now, so oh. I can watch this. Let's give them some love hearts. Touch the screen. Love hearts for partners, supporting partners doing PhD. Thanks, love hearts. Yeah, for all the people cooking, for other people watching this live stream. Oh, I just got a question from Shefton Parker. And the question is about, I'm guessing it's about publications, PhDs by publication. Some unis are going that way. What do you think? Some unis are going PhD by publication. What do I think? I think um, for most people, it's a great thing. In sciences, in a lot of universities, it's almost the most common way to do a PhD. I think I got asked a similar question last week, didn't I? I don't remember. I've got a book. Hold that thought. <laughs> um, more <laughs> questions while I find the book on my shelf, but I shouldn't say that I can find a book and then not be able to find it under pressure. We have a book from Hannah Nielsen. Yeah. These meta questions. What is the point of a research degree? Oh my goodness. No, no pressure. No pressure. Um, I can't find the book. There is a book. I'll find it and I'll tweet it about um, PhD by publication that's been published recently. It sets out all the pros and cons. And I think really you need advice from your discipline 
Um, some disciplines, and I know Pat Thompson has some views on this, don't view it with the same degree of love as other disciplines. Um, in the humanities, there's some questions around it because some people feel we're just adopting a science model and is this the way forward? And in the sciences, it's well recognised that a PhD by publication is a way of creating a portfolio as you work. Okay, um, sorry, Steph, that question is, what is the point of a research degree? Absolutely. Well, I don't know about you, but I wanted a job. <laughs> it was really that simple for me, and I realised that if I wanted to be an academic, I had to have a PhD, and that was a simple fact, so I just tried to enjoy it the best way I could while I did it, because I had to. Um, but people, your mileage may vary greatly. I mean, there's some people who are in their 60s and they're doing PhDs for completely different reasons. Sometimes they want to change careers, they want to find something to do after retirement that's different, or they want to record a life's work in some way. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to see what people on Twitter say is why why do a PhD. I think personally it enriched and, and broadened my experience and I still use some of the theoretical frameworks that I thought about during my PhD to get through committee meetings sometimes. I sit there and think about them like actor network theory situations. I mean, you can amuse your own mind for ages with things you learn in your PhD. I know that Katie over here did her PhD on remix culture. How cool is that? And she is the most entertaining person to talk to about TV shows that you could ever hope yeah, to know. meet. So, you know, like I think it has a lot of benefits. I'm not being totally facetious. I watched TV for my thesis. She watched TV for her thesis. Yeah. Now that is genius. I planned it all out real well. <laughs> um, uh, we have another question from Laura Carmen on yep. Twitter. Laura asks, do you have advice for scholarship applications? I'm just finishing honours uh -huh. um, and kind of looking to go into PhD. Advice for scholarship applications. Most of them work on a grade point average. If you don't have a really great grade point average, and I didn't, because when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I was more interested in beer and boys. And I had very bad grades. And my friends, I had to go and do a research uh, degree, um, a master's degree, to clear my record. So grade point average really matters um, a lot. Other things that you can do that add little extra points are things like writing papers, publishing papers, um, and getting great references, of course, is really important. See if you can get references from professors, from people higher up in the hierarchy. That always helps as well. But it's incredibly competitive, so don't beat yourself up if you didn't get it. I didn't get it the first time around because despite doing the master's degree, I still hadn't cleared my record enough. And so I just performed outrageously well in the first year of my PhD. I hit all my benchmarks. I did presentations and then I asked the faculty for a scholarship and they gave me one sort of six or seven months in. And I recently had a student do the same thing. So that's the alternative pathway. So don't give up. Um, you can demonstrate other ways that you're eligible for a scholarship and also look in some of those scholarship databases because sometimes there's little pots of money for very specific kinds of projects all over the place. So keep at it. I would also say that I didn't get a PhD scholarship, so I did a master's instead. And then halfway through the master's, they said, do you want to do a PhD and get a scholarship? Okay, so I don't know if you heard that very well, but Katie got the other back door in, which is to start in a master's, demonstrate your, your, you know, your potential, and then be offered a PhD scholarship. The other way, of course, is to jump on someone else's project, and um, where it's got they're often difficulty even giving away scholarships um, because people don't want to do other people's projects. But but hey, I think that's a fully legitimate way to do a PhD. Uh, other questions? Any questions in Periscope? You guys are sending lots of lovely love hearts, but you can also type questions for me if you have any. I know I've sort of haven't answered some that have swept by there, but it does go by very fast when you're talking. If there's any in Twitter in the meantime, Katie? Yeah, I'm just having a look. Um, you might have to dance and do Just dance. <laughs> There was a comment earlier about whether there was age discrimination for PhDs and masters. Mm. It wasn't framed as a question, but that might be something. Is there age discrimination? Mm. Yes, I've seen it. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's age discrimination on entry to a PhD. Uh, I did read somewhere that China doesn't let anyone over the age of 40 actually start one. I don't know if someone can confirm that for me, but that wow. was in a book I read. So some, sometimes maybe it's institutionalised age discrimination. Um, but in Australia, of course, there's laws against it. And, um, you know, I, I think it happens, but in numerous and very subtle ways. And actually, there's some really interesting discussions developing on the MOOC amongst people who are over the age of 55, around 60s. And some uh, have um, 
you know, have talked about uh, um, and just getting together and chatting about that and starting a Facebook group. I noticed there was a question there on Periscope um, about speeding up the publication process. Short answer is you really can't. Um, there's so many papers in the systems um, that that many journals are just swamped and overwhelmed. I just I, I think special issues are maybe the fastest way through that. There was another question on Periscope just then about the role of HDR administrators of of the administrators as supporters in the department. And can I tell you, those guys, just sending the love, they are the most amazing people generally. Uh, they are very hard working and they do it. Um, they do an amazing job on often, um, you know, fairly long hours and fairly sort of thankless work places occasionally, I think it's fair to say. Um, and a big shout out to those people who support, um, support students that way. Um, a lot of parent, publish or perish talk was a question, so it's very hard to follow these Periscope questions. Well, a lot of publish or perish talk or publish and be doomed talk from postdocs, you know, how true is it? Oh, where do you even start? Totally true for me. Totally, <laughs> probably totally true. Um, but in this day and age, there's many ways to publish. So, you know, um, I do a lot of blogging, as you know and uh, I write articles in newspapers and so on. And that seems to be well regarded in terms of, I hope, in terms of promotion metrics and so on. So a lot of the times universities are starting to recognise these other forms of, of research output. But yeah, there's no doubt about it that publish or perish or get grant money or perish um, is, uh, is really the competitive structures of, of academia. And that's, I think, the culture of overwork that goes with it and the social impacts of that, um, uh, you know, need to be recognised. Um, so, yes. No, no, any other questions there? How do you avoid self-plagiarism with your PhD in publishing? How to avoid self-plagiarism? Um, go see your librarian, please. Love your local librarian. <laughs> Love your local librarian. Um, mostly they're the people that, that know about plagiarism, that know about the rules. Also your academic skills and learning units inside universities can review documents. I mean, the rule of thumb is no more than three lines from someone else, but that's just a rule of thumb. Self-plagiarism in a PhD by publication is a really tricky issue. I mean, if you're republishing something that's been publishing, is it plagiarism? Don't forget you need to get copyright um, permission from the journal um, authors. What is self-plagiarism? Um, self-plagiarism is quoting yourself without saying that you've quoted yourself. So basically lifting text from one document that you've published and putting it in another. Um, it's generally thought about as uncool. Um, if you're the sort of person who sort of publishes five papers and largely um, you're just putting the same text in the same different articles, you lose credibility pretty quickly. Um, why, is impact, um, why is impact not the priority uh, person here asked on, on Periscope? Uh, impact is becoming increasingly a priority for universities because governments are asking them to report on impact. I think the UK is probably most advanced on this spectrum and it's probably something we might pick up in the Twitter conversation. Um, I'd like to hear more positive stories about supervisors. Mine are great, says G McKinnon, um, but it feels like it's rare. I don't think it's rare, actually. I think it's just that old thing that Tolstoy used to say, what is it, that happy families are all alike and unhappy families are all different. In, what did he say? This is... Now, he said that great quote about unhappy families. I think we just talk about unhappy supervision more. When your supervisor is awesome, um, we don't feel like we need to say it. So thank you, all those people who are saying, I've got great supervisors. Yeah, most people do have really great supervisors. And in fact, if we look at the feedback from students, um, they seem to get most of the love. It's usually about 85% agreement here in ANU that supervisors are awesome. So that, that's pretty good feedback. Any other questions? We might call it a night. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of uh, self-plagiarism. Uh-oh. Oh, self-plagiarism. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, we'll try and chase up some stuff and put it on Twitter for you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sticking with us through this broadcast. And sorry about the technical hitches at the end. Thank you for the love hearts. It's always so nice. And um, we will be posting this link up on the MOOC in our what section is it called our wrap out section don't forget too that there's a checklist there for you to fill in thanks for the love heart